right? Holly will share with us a response um, in a short while. Thank you for participating. Um, Pauline, do we have uh, the results? Okay, it should be coming up soon. Yes, uh, well, that's all right. Um, most of, about 57% um, doesn't know much about innovation challenge, just okay. Uh, we will soon find out more about it from the panel um, that we have this afternoon. And there are interests in for better people and better society. And um, mm, um, the most serious world problem today is uh, COVID-19. Yes, thank you very much. All right. So um, this afternoon, we have um, with us um, the the three um, co-chair from the uh, different uh, aspect of how uh, us as uh, graduates uh, could uh, do a better, uh, contribute to better uh, people, a better society and the environment. So before I introduce the, uh, uh, the, the speakers, uh, a few housekeeping items. Uh, all of us uh, attendees will be placed on mute. And uh, those of us with questions, you may uh, put the questions through the Q&A tab. There will be a vote up of questions uh, as well. And we will attempt to, uh, we attempt to answer as many questions as possible. So this webinar will be recorded and will be made available on the NUSS uh, YouTube. Uh, the the yeah, outline of the webinar will be, we'll, we will start off with uh, Dr. Cynthia uh, Teddy Ang, the Director for Strategic uh, and Synergic uh, Tech Programs at the Office of the Senior Deputy uh, President and Provost to, to give us an overview of what is the NUS Innovation Challenge, how all of us, uh, both NUS and non-NUS graduates could participate. Then thereafter, um, we will have the following professors, uh, Professor uh, Chesterman, co-chair of the B a Better People panel, Dean of the Faculty of Law, uh, will come on to share with us what, uh, what will be the panel looking for, and also give us some examples uh, of uh, Better People uh, uh, initiative. And then uh, Professor uh, Robbie, Professor Go, Robbie Go co-chair of the Better Society, uh, dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, will come on to, to share with us more about uh, Better uh, Society. And, and then we will have Professor uh, Poond, uh, uh, KK, uh, Professor KK Poond, co-chair of the Better Environment panel, is a senior um, vice provost, academic affairs, and also presently, the distinguished professor will talk more about uh, environmental. So the Q&A questions we expect to start about uh, 1.35 to about 1.55. Give us about 20 minutes uh, for all of us to seek clarifications and also share our views, uh, share your views. And uh, please uh, send your questions uh, to the panel anytime during the webinar. So I very quickly uh, move on to inviting uh, Dr. Cynthia Tan uh, to kick off the webinar. Uh, may I invite Cynthia, please? Thank you, Kwan Tai. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to go through a brief, short three pages of uh, three slides. Uh, presentation to uh, introduce about the innovation challenge and uh, and uh, the three panels. Um, Pauline, will you be showing the slides, please? All right. Um, okay. So uh, for 
complete information or comprehensive information on the challenge, you can actually go through the website listed there, uh, nus.edu slash innovation challenge. Um, uh, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so uh, year 2020 has proven to be a challenging year for everyone. And, but then behind every challenges, there are thousands of opportunity. And this is exactly what uh, Innovation Challenge is about. So what is uh, Innovation Challenge? This is um, uh, funding that's provided by NUS um, to fund uh, 115 projects. This is actually to also celebrate our uh, 115 anniversary. Um, involving uh, about 600 graduates um, in teams of three to five people. Um, and uh, the objective is actually to encourage and empower our graduates to have impact on our people, our society and the world, especially um, in this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, era. Um, for the, the funding provided is uh, about 50,000 per project uh, for a team of three to five members for a period of six months. So um, this, uh, the team uh, needs to consist, consist of um, NUS graduates. Uh, all, I mean, uh, all our alumni are welcome, but uh, only class, uh, graduates class 2018, 19, and 20 will be eligible to receive a stipend of up to 1,200 uh, per person per month. And then the rest of the budget will go to uh, fund the consumables and all the development expenses. And what we are looking for is for uh, ideas with big impact that focus on the changing uh, the world. Okay, so the, the challenge itself is um, divided into three categories. Uh, better people, um, the, the, uh, uh, with uh, co the co-chair, uh, Prof. Simon Chesterman. Uh, the better society, uh, chaired by uh, Prof. Robigo and The Better World, uh, chaired by uh, Prof. Poon. So each or one of them will actually speak later on to highlight what exactly the, each of the panel are looking for. Um, next. So uh, the challenge is open since uh, the 1st of June up until 31st of uh, December 2020. And we will be receiving uh, and evaluating proposals in three ways. Uh, the first wave is already over, so we, we closed our first deadline on the 31st of July and currently all three, three panels are evaluating proposals. Uh, so for the first wave, the selected or successful project is expected to start on, the, uh, on 1st of September 2020. Uh, the next uh, deadline will be coming up on, will, is on the 30th of September 2020. And finally, the last wave will be on the 31st December. So, um, each of the projects um, are eligible to uh, to be uh, to for resubmission in case uh, they actually failed in, uh, in in the first round. They can actually resub re, uh, re resubmit their proposal uh, to be considered in the next round. Um, okay, so call for participation. So everyone, uh, welcome to participate in the innovation challenge. These are the five ways that I can think of actually uh, at least on how. Uh, each, uh, everyone can actually participate in this. Okay, you can be the, a team member, so the Innovation Challenge is open to all NUS graduates. Uh, you can be a mentor they, they, to mentor uh, teams in proposal, both proposal creation as well as the project execution stage. Uh, you can be a volunteer to work on the project, and these are not limited to just uh, our alumni. We, can, we actually have uh, our current uh, undergraduates and our current graduate students being part of the team as a volunteer. Uh, or you can be a project inspirator where you can actually provide the problem statements that is interesting for the teams to actually consider and build proposal around. And finally, you can actually be a project sponsor uh, um, and by donate, donating to support uh, one project or two. Okay, uh, with, with that, uh, I shall pass it on to Prof. Uh, Simon Chesterman who will talk more about the Better People panel. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, in this panel talking to our NUSS members about uh, the Innovation and Growth Challenge. Um, as Cynthia's highlighted, this really came out of 2020 being an extraordinary year for our graduates. Uh, but the way I look at it, we're really trying to do two things at the same time, both of which are important, but which are somewhat 
um, discrete uh, activities. First, we are trying to help our graduates. We are trying to create opportunities for bridging employment. That's why the stipend is limited to the classes of 2018, 19 and 20, uh, who do face a particularly challenging economic climate that they're coming into. But secondly, we are really trying to encourage them and the wider NUS graduate community to have an impact, to make a difference, to help, as we've said, our people, our society, uh, and indeed the world. Uh, and uh, from that poll earlier, I forgive you for uh, helping our people, my panel only coming second, uh, but, uh, but there's a chance to make up for that. There is a and a function down the bottom. Please do ask your questions. I see one person's already asked a question, which we'll get to shortly, uh, but, uh, but do please uh, raise your questions. This is an opportunity for us to share a little bit with you, but really we're also interested in your questions for us. Um, so given that we're trying both to have an impact and to help our graduates, the process by which we run this enterprise is very important. Uh, and so one of the things we're trying to do is ensure that our undergraduates in particular, the graduating students, are able to be mentored, to be guided. Because for many of them, this is gonna be the first time they're ever making a pitch. It's the first time they're really trying to be entrepreneurial in a, in a very concrete sense. So some of them will be a little bit naive. And that's why it's so important if, if there's an opportunity for them to partner either in terms of the teams that they form or having mentors to draw on the wider NUS community uh, and beyond uh, to offer that additional expertise, that guidance. Uh, and so as you watch this presentation, uh, do think about how you might want to get involved, either as a team member yourself, but also as a mentor, which is something I'll, I'll come back to momentarily. Now, we're already into the process, uh, and indeed next week, uh, my panel will be meeting with uh, participants who've put up some really fascinating proposals. Uh, we had, I think, uh, more than uh, almost 30 uh, applications just to my panel alone. Uh, and from that, we've shortlisted 17 who'll be making pitches to us next week. Uh, we, there were three that are incomplete, so we've sent that back. Uh, and then there were another eight or so that were interesting, but not quite there. And so what we've done is provided written comments uh, to send it back to the team and encourage them to make a resubmission for the second round. Uh, and we're in the happy position that we have really strong support of NUS and the government uh, that's enabling us to, to really uh, reach out to a large number of students. So how are we in fact going to be making these choices? Uh, let me just put up um, uh, the, the way in which we're doing it in my, sub, in my panel. Uh, so Melissa Kui and I are co-chairing it. Uh, and we've really been delighted to have, uh, essentially everyone we asked has agreed to come onto our panel. Uh, and so we've got a really interesting mix, I won't go through the names, but it's a mix of NUS staff who are passionate in this area, uh, but also people who've really made an impact either through their own philanthropic organizations or their social activism. Uh, and the one person I will really call out is Melissa Kui herself uh, from NVPC, the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Council, uh, who's been uh, a, real, a real delight to work with and an inspiration to the other panelists. And I'm sure when they meet her, virtually at least, uh, to, the, uh, to the students who are pitching and the recent graduates who are pitching. So what are we looking for? Um, so this is just text from the website. I break it down to three things. We want applications that are thoughtful. So something that demonstrates the creativity that, uh, that we know NUS graduates uh, have in abundance. Uh, secondly, that's innovative, um, something that's not entirely new, not, not entirely been done before, something that either draws connections or transforms the way in which we think about an enterprise. Uh, and we also want things that are going to have an impact. Now, at the same time, this is a six month project. So we do have to be realistic. And indeed my panel, we've had candid conversations about this. We're not expecting people in the space of six months to change the world. But our hope is that some years from now, looking back, this enterprise, this opportunity has planted the seeds of entrepreneurialism, of community spirit that does live on in projects that outlast the uh, duration of this, this six month seed funding opportunity. Um, in terms of the process, what do the students have to, what do the graduates have to uh, put in? Uh, there's a written component. Uh, they're meant to outline which category, which of the three panels they're addressing. Who is their target community? Who are they trying to help? What is the value proposition? What is the benefit of their particular project going to be? Um, to what extent do they have partners and the possibility of translating that impact? Uh, and really that's one of the biggest hurdles for our graduates because they're extremely bright, but not always worldwide. Uh, and so perhaps there are NUSS members who could partner with them, mentor them, as I said, 
uh, and really give them that guidance how to translate ideas into action. Uh, and then most importantly, really from our perspective as a panel, we wanna know not just what the idea is, but what outcomes they hope for, how they would measure impact, what success would mean. Uh, and then of course, there's a budget. Now, next week we have our first pitches and really what we're looking for there is an opportunity to engage with the, the team. Uh, so they're gonna make a very brief presentation. We've already got their three page written document. Uh, we're mostly interested in how they will engage with the panel uh, and answer questions like, what impact are you looking for? How are you going to measure that impact? Um, now, lastly, let me just give you a, a flavor of some of the proposals that we're already considering. Uh, and this is without prejudice to the decision, but to give you a sense of the sort of things that have been proposed under the uh, help make our people better. And it ranges from things uh, directly inspired by COVID-19, like an app that will encourage the elderly in particular to be physically active, even if they're stuck inside, uh, to really interesting uh, ways in which we can tap on the small community spaces that we have to encourage greater connection with our community. Uh, and so there's an interesting proposal to use um, elevators in HDB apartments as points of connection, not in person, but virtually. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of lifelong learning. That's clearly something that is really important to maximizing human capital, how we can create opportunities and ensure that opportunities are meaningful for lifelong learning uh, as uh, people have to reskill or upskill. Um, and then home-based learning has been another big topic. Uh, how kids do science at home in the hopefully unlikely event that, uh, that uh, primary and secondary school will go back to home-based learning. And then we've had off the wall um, proposals like someone wanting to make a film, uh, which is a really interesting idea uh, that is going to encourage people to rethink the way in which they engage with their community. So that's something a little bit briefly about uh, what we're looking for and what we're looking at in the Help Make Our People Better panel. But um, I'm gonna pause here, hand over to uh, Prof. Robbie Goh, my colleague from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, uh, and then look forward to uh, trying to answer some of your questions in the time that remains. So I'll hand over to Robbie now. Thanks. Hello everyone, uh, thanks so much for tuning in to this webinar. Um, Professor Chesterman has given a very comprehensive and very useful overview of, of what's been going on in the uh, project as a whole. So I won't uh, repeat a lot of that useful information. I'll talk a little bit more specifically about this team, Making Society Better. So um, if Professor Chesterman's team focuses on human capability, human capital, I would say that this team my theme, uh, Making Society Better, focuses on uh, vulnerable uh, members of the community. And this could include uh, people like um, the elderly, um, the handicapped in various ways, um, uh, even gig workers uh, and uh, other people that may not traditionally have been seen as uh, vulnerable members. So the idea of this theme really is that to ensure that uh, nobody gets left behind or to speak more realistically, that as few people get left behind as possible. Uh, I think what's happened with uh, COVID is that uh, it's raised, created new vulnerable groups and new vulnerabilities that uh, maybe traditional social work has not uh, uh, been uh, aware of. Right? So uh, if, if of the three panels, I think uh, making society better is most closely as, uh, aligned with what we normally think of as traditional social work. But as I said, COVID-19 is changing uh, the perspective of that as well. So for example, um, people who have had no choice but to work in gig economies, for example, gig economies that have been uh, particularly affected by COVID. That's one area that uh, I think it would be very interesting for the, the applicants to, to try to, to address. Um, it's changed the, the definition of a vulnerability. So I had no idea that uh, I'm almost a vulnerable uh, person because COVID-19 has taught us that anybody 60 and above uh, is now considered vulnerable. So I'm near, uh, I, for the first time in my life, I'm, I'm considering myself as a, a member of a near vulnerable community as well. Uh, and then the question becomes, how do we uh, find innovative, effective, practical ways to try to help these vulnerable communities at this time? So I think that's the challenge. Um, the Make Society Better panel has come up with a kind of evaluation matrix which will give you a sense of what we are looking for. Right? So we are, we are looking for innovation, 
uh, and we're giving 40% of the, the evaluation uh, uh, mark to, to innovation. And within innovation, we would like to see a very, very sp uh, uh, specific identification of a problem. Yeah, so not just you know, vague outlines, I, this community needs help, basically, right? But uh, what are the challenges facing this community? And in what ways can the proposal specifically address certain concerns about the communities? Um, so we've had some interesting proposals already to do with, for example, uh, lower income families and diet. Lower income family, I, I, which of course you know makes sense in general, and uh, has been exacerbated by the the COVID situation, where it's more difficult to get access to to groceries. Sometimes uh, the elderly people who may have traditionally done the the shopping uh, are now are unable to move about so freely. Uh, nutrition takes a sort of backseat to other sort of concerns about income um, income streams and those kind of schooling, home based learning and those kinds of issues as well, right? So that's a very specific kind of identification of a problem which I think is, is very, very good. Um, within innovation, we're also looking at the feasibility of the so solution proposed, right? Uh, it, it's great to identify a, a very, very specific problem, but if the, there's no, there's a kind of mismatch between the proposed solution and uh, the problem identified, then that's not going to work either. So feasibility is part of the 40% the, the given to innovation. Uh, next, we're going to give 40% to impact. Uh, and that makes sense, obviously. Yeah. Uh, to what extent can the proposal deliver impact, not just on the vulnerable community, but we're hoping as well as a kind of um, a systemic change, either through inspiring other people in, in society, or maybe coming up with a, a methodology, or even an app using leveraging tech uh, to be able to, to make impact. Uh, on society, right? Uh, so partnerships and collaborations, that's where I think NUSS uh, is particularly helpful. Uh, we are looking always for mentors, for people, as, as uh, Professor Chesterman says, wiser and more experienced heads who can guide our intelligent, but sometimes a bit naive, you know, uh, inexperienced students in, in how best to, to relate to these uh, vulnerable communities. So partnerships and collaborations is one aspect of impact. The other one would be outcomes, obviously, yeah? Uh, and then finally, we think that this, the, bearing in mind that the goal of this whole innovation challenge is really to twofold. One is to uh, provide relief for the, uh, our, our own recent graduates, but the other as well is to help uh, vulnerable groups. Then, um, and, to, and for, the group, for the students to form a kind of uh, example, insp hopefully inspiration to other members of society. The last 20% we're going to assign to passion and learning. Right? Uh, in what way is this whole project going to be a kind of learning opportunity? Uh, what kind of learning outcomes and self-reflection is evident in the whole project? Uh, what do we see that the passion for what they're doing? So my panel is going to start interviewing uh, hopefully next week or the week after. Uh, and the interview process will allow us to identify that kind of passion, the reflexivity. Uh, and, and really one of the largest sort of meta goals really is to get our students uh, inspired with the whole spirit of helping. That will hopefully continue long after COVID-19 is over. Uh, that will hopefully last them all their lives so that they in turn can, can sort of uh, um, uh, mentor other people, inspire other people uh, to, to, to have that helping spirit. Uh, with that, I will stop and hand the time over to Prof. Boon. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I on? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I believe uh, Prof. Chesterman and Prof. Robigo has given us a very good um, outline because we wanted to keep to the time so that there'll be more um, FAQ available for us to have a discussion. So if I could briefly just mention that we are also in the same um, stage where we have received uh, 20 proposals. And we'll be meeting next week to have a look at the proposal. Certainly, um, our criteria will not uh, deviate too um, widely from what uh, Prof. Robbie Go and Prof. Uh, Simon Chesterman has actually proposed um, for, their, for their particular um, uh, themes. Uh, very quickly, um, maybe I could say that um, the lines between... Are you hearing me? Hello? Am I too soft or something? 
you're fine now. Thank you. So um, I'm not sure how much we missed out, but I wanted to say that uh, among the three teams, uh, better people, better society, better world, um, essentially there are no clear, hello? Essentially there are no clear lines um, between the three teams. And uh, the, three panels were, the three panels would be interacting to share notes um, regarding a proposals that may be straddling uh, between um, say better society and better world. And if I may, um, let me provide my personal take very quickly about what I think um, a better world should be. I, I thought it'd be really interesting to ask ourselves the question, better world for who? Um, so that would be a good question. And some of us may be thinking it would be better work for the human inhabitants, but that, that may not be, be a complete picture because all of us are recognizing the larger picture of climate change and sustainability. One of the, um, one of the uh, very interesting ideas that has been shared very recently, maybe over the past um, 20 years, is to rename the current uh, geologic epoch as a Anthropocene. So for those of you who may not be that familiar with geology, you know, we map the, um, the history of the entire Earth um, based on various uh, geologic events. And this is the first time we decided, or the debate is ongoing, whether we should um, name the current epoch as an uh, Anthropocene. That means, in other words, um, our human presence is so massive and so huge that basically um, our presence and our activities is modifying the planet itself, which um, means that if we are not managing the planet in a way that is sustainable, this is clearly um, not too good a picture uh, for us. So I'm just putting that in, um, in a nutshell that, that perhaps would, could um, elicit a more question at a subsequent um, point when we have our FAQ. Um, maybe I could just give a last um, comment um, so that I could stop. Um, certainly, as what Pro Chesterman and Pro Robigo has said, um, not only do we would like to have something that is concrete in terms of deliverable within six months, we do value the learning journey involved um, in this particular innovation challenge. So, for those of you um, who are really interested, inspired to do this, I'll encourage you to do that. And um, maybe one of the things that I would imagine if I were to be young enough and I, I'm graduating, say this year. I would, I would want to think about this opportunity that is being offered to me and maybe I think about all those, um, all those thoughts that I, I've never shared with anybody. You know, things that you felt is so difficult and so complex that it's, it's way, way beyond what you feel you can ever solve. And I, I think those will be the kind of a really inspirational thing you want know, to think about um, to take part in this challenge. Basically, um, look at those things that you think is surely impossible for you to make a difference. Um, as what Prof. Chesterman says, um, there will be mentors um, and there will be NGOs actually who are interested to participate, to guide you along and to work with you as well. So it's not like you doing it by yourself. I think I better stop here. Somehow um, I'm getting um, feedback that my mic is not working. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, KK. Yes, uh, we are finished with the presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Cynthia, as well as sharing from uh, the three co-chairs uh, that you will hear from. Certainly, I've gained a lot more information, particularly what the panels are looking for and also looking at. And when Prof. Robbie shared about the evaluation criteria, that is very enlightening as well and very helpful. So I think it's good that we move on very quickly to the Q&A sessions so that the panel is going to address uh, the questions that we are seeing um, in the Q&A. So the first, actually, the first question is, um, how does mentoring uh, for Innovation Challenge work? Do the teams look for their own mentors or are the mentors matched to the teams? Um, so maybe uh, Prof. Simon, you could take this question on. 
Sure. So this is something that uh, we're we're discussing with our panel, and I should say that I, I like Robbie's analysis of the um, that the breakdown of the different percentages. Although we, as a panel, decided not to go down that path, partly because we weren't entirely certain what we would get in this first round, and it's the same thing with mentors. So what we want to do is have a look at the whole picture, uh, and then see if we can match people up. Uh, and I should be clear, we're looking to match our successful grantees up with mentors, both within and outside the NUS community. Uh, so in that sense, it's really a, a two-stage process for us. The first is selecting the sex successful grantees uh, and then trying to match them up with mentors or partners who can help magnify the impact of their project and, in candidly, increase the, the chances that it will actually materialize, it will actually play out as, as hoped for. Uh, and then I suppose a third aspect is, is what happens afterwards. Uh, and when we do attach mentors, we're not asking for a lifelong commitment, um, but we are hoping uh, that someone who attaches as a mentor to a six month project will be open at least to seeing where that relationship might go in the future, either in terms of the project itself or potentially employment opportunities uh, for the students, for the recent graduates involved. Thank you. So that means those of us who are keen to be a mentor, we will send in our um, uh, particulars so that Prof Simon, for example, as a co-chair on the panel could decide and matches with the appropriate um, team, right, uh, Prof Simon? Exactly. So, um, and I think uh, the Secretary has been enormously helpful in uh, being a clearinghouse for all the projects that have come in. And so hopefully we can do something similar with potential mentors. Okay, thank you. All right. So let's move on to the um, second questions. Uh, if I look at the, um, the second one, this innovation challenge is only uh, for graduates in the year 2018, 2019, or 2020. How for NUS grads who graduate before 2018? Maybe Prof. Robbie, you could address this question? Uh, you're going to make me the bad guy. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't hold the purse strings, but uh, if I can just speak on behalf of the, the originating intent, as it were, right? I think uh, we recognize, in fact, uh, it, it, the early discussion uh, intended only the 2020 graduates to be uh, uh, recipients of this uh, grant. Uh, but then we recognize that uh, be, you know, it sometimes takes a graduate some time to find a steady employment. You know, uh, The first year or two, they may be still looking. Uh, they may have uh, some kind of gig or temporary appointment. So we backdated it to 2019 and 2018 graduates as well. I suppose the point is that, you know, as always, in, in everything in this world, we have uh, unlimited uh, ones but limited resources. We have to draw the line somewhere. And I think this is a very reasonable and inclusive, fairly inclusive, relatively inclusive way to, to define this, you know, that we're going back to 2018, but we have to, we have to draw the line somewhere. And I, we, our hope, of course, our expectation is that people who graduated earlier uh, would by now be, you know, uh, steady in their employment and in their careers. I guess that's the, the reasoning, that's the thinking. Right. If I may add, may add uh, so actually all graduate, NUS graduates are welcome. It's just that the graduates of class 2018, 19, and 2020 will be eligible for the stipend. The rest can still participate. It's just that they are not eligible to draw the stipend. Right. However, at the same time, thank you, uh, the Prof. Robbie and Dr. Cynthia. But at the same time, uh, there are actually uh, aspects, if, for example, the particular idea of project require POC, proof of concept. Uh, require materials, require uh, uh, you know some uh, reimbursement. So that in itself actually is reimbursable. I think the payback for those of us who are graduating much earlier is contributing to the meaningful projects and seeing the outcome uh, that has a far better impact beyond us. You know, for the people, the society of the world. I think that's where the payback come from the satisfaction of knowing that we have contributed and be part of this initiative. Okay, so let's move on to the third questions. Um, similarly, what about overseas graduates and postgraduates who graduated or graduating in 2020? Are they eligible for this? Maybe Cynthia, you could um, take this question. Yeah, sure. So they are eligible. So um, the, 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 the project execution did not be uh, in I mean need not be done in Singapore. So there are some teams which whose one of their members are actually uh, located overseas, based overseas, and they they can still 
participate in the challenge and they can still uh, receive the stipend as long as they have Singapore bank account. Yeah, I hope that clarifies. Thank you. Yes. Um, plus, maybe just to add in that specifically does include graduate students, uh, the master's programs and PhDs and so on. It's not just limited to undergraduate. Uh, That's right. Yeah, good point. Yes, and, and let's move on to um, another question. Um, are there short-term research related opportunities in relation to the innovation challenge? Maybe there's another avenue. Um, uh, so Prof. Simon, since you're, we're seeing you now, maybe you can take this question. Um, so the, the pro this, uh, this whole innovation challenge is really intended to be an inspiration rather than to dominate the field. So we're talking about a six month program. Uh, of course, there are lots of opportunities around there and maybe on the margins of some of these, uh, there could well be uh, opportunities for research, short term opportunities. Uh, but there is a separate NUS uh, project, which is the traineeships that we've created. So across the university, there are lots of traineeships being uh, established that are another way in which we're involving um, students and recent graduates uh, in NUS. Uh, mm -hmm. But in terms of the specifics of each project, it would really be up to the the uh, conveners of each proposal to work out what additional research would be necessary. Uh, although I do think it's quite appropriate that many of the proposals, at least that I've received uh, on my panel, uh, do include a research component because I don't think any of the graduates were really in a position to say, okay, I completely understand the market, I completely understand the needs. Uh, so many of the proposals do include a research phase uh, and perhaps that's a way NUSS members uh, could get involved in some of those projects. Mm. Right, so, so that means to say, Prof. Simon, that those uh, graduates of, uh, those members of the NUSS, if our company uh, are facing some issues, uh, that could be a, uh, a, a potential um, a problem, problem uh, statement sponsor. Or we are now volunteering in an NGO, for example. So the NGO facing some issues that they can actually share with the secretariat, that perhaps this could be a problem statement sponsor and, and then, could then pass it on to uh, graduates that can consider finding out more with this about from this NGO. Is that right? Uh, so that, that's a slightly different point, but it would also be a good way to proceed. Uh, again, one of the things we considered in our panel uh, was to outline a very specific statement of needs where we went through the process of thinking, well, we've got the National Voluntary, uh, Volunteer and Philanthropy Council involved. We've got all these NGOs involved, voluntary worker organizations as well. Uh, social enterprises, we could just come up with a list of questions and ask our students to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. The reason we didn't do that uh, is it goes back to uh, the real driving motivation behind this. In addition to helping our students financially uh, and helping have an impact, we really want to encourage that spirit of entrepreneurialism. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I do think one of the most impactful aspects of this entire enterprise is encouraging graduates, in particular recent graduates, to look at the world and not answer the questions that we give them, but to come up with their own questions and some possible answers. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, explains very well. Thank you very much. So the next question is, the, uh, will NUS and the various panels help with the funding of projects that have demonstrated potential tangible benefits or and connect students with relevant stakeholders, uh, i.e. what's NUS roles host this RNG program. Maybe Prof KK, you can take this. Um, yes, I could do that. Can you hear me? Because yeah. I'm getting some comments that my previous a uh, presentation was too soft. No, it's very clear. Thank you. It's good now. Um, yes, uh, again, you know, if I could um, just provide my take of uh, what this uh, innovation challenge is about. Um, on our part, I think the panel, the panel will be looking for suitable mentors, um, not just those who volunteers, but through our own network, um, people that could be willing to work with the team, especially if they put up a really compelling uh, a proposition. But I, I, I thought it was um, either Prof. Chesterman or Prof. Robbie Go who says that um, we're also looking for that kind of team who is going to value this opportunity in the sense that um, perhaps under more normal times, we are thinking that after I graduate, I'm going to get myself a job and therefore I see myself in this future. But this is a chance for us to actually step out of whatever um, kind of imagine, imagination that we had, um, what our past senior has done 
the kind of career they have developed. But maybe you want to take an octagonal pathway, start talking to people totally outside your network, uh, totally people that you never thought you're going to talk to. And this could in involve um, NGOs, it could involve um, people who are already out there um, funding projects uh, for social good. Uh, it's a six months, to me it's a seed, right? I think the, pan the panel chair has discussed that this is a seed. And maybe you really get excited and then by doing that, you know, you're able to uh, marshal funds to continue. And we're hoping that you will continue actually because we go back to the six months limitation to make it really um, uh, meaningful. So I, I thought it's both ways actually. If we're really successful, you can make that kind of very compelling pitch. I think there are lots of funding out there actually that will allow you to continue. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, in the next question is from April, uh, Sarah. So is, is the first wave of applications, uh, in the first phase of uh, wave of applications, what are the demographic of applicants in terms of age, group, grads and undergrads? Is it possible to share? Uh, Prof. Robbie, uh, is that possible to, to give, an, give us an idea? We haven't done a detailed analysis, I have to admit, but uh, from a cursory examination, it looks as though most of them are undergraduates. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I think it's the same with our panel. The majority seem to be recent undergraduates, partly because I think they're the easiest ones for us to reach out to, so they got the email information, um, but also they're really the ones who are facing uh, the very challenging job market at the moment. Uh, and so taking up this opportunity. Uh, but as we've stressed throughout, this is not limited to them. Uh, and so if there are people on this call who are interested in putting in a proposal, there's still two more rounds to go. So please do think about doing so. Thank you. Right. So I think um, the this particular uh, initiative uh, of professors, um, the NUS uh, uh, membership members, as a mentor, um, could you give it a bit more? What are you look? What specific type of mentors are we looking for, so that we can actually share that uh, with our members uh, after this webinar? Is there any particular industry? Is there any uh, profession, uh, experience, or skills that you're looking for? I'll look. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. And there's there's a question. Um that I think echoes uh, part of this that I, I think we uh, might want to touch on, which is how, how does this extend beyond one project to become sustainable uh, and practical for a better people, society and the world? Uh, and so I would think of this in two dimensions in terms of mentors. One is just that general skill set, world experience, life experience uh, that many of our recent graduates in particular don't have. Uh, and so being able to give them that perspective generally, that would be useful in and of itself. But then as you drill down into particular sectors, I mean, we've already highlighted a few of the areas uh, that uh, the projects are likely to touch on. Uh, and that includes particularly in terms of the vulnerable populations uh, that I've spoken about, that Robbie's spoken about in our sort of help our people, help our society. Uh, those who are working with um, one project I didn't mention, people with disabilities. Uh, the, um, uh, there's uh, a reason we included the, um, uh, uh, New Life Stories, which has uh, a connection to incarcerated persons, people coming out of prison, uh, people who are not most easily supported by existing structures. And that's what we're particularly interested in or needs that are new. So, for example, just to touch on one, home-based learning uh, is something that uh, I think we all uh, understood was kind of important in the abstract, but suddenly when for two months all the children are at home, it transforms the way in which you think about home-based learning. Uh, and so if there are people out there who have particular insights either into the educational side or the technology side or the social welfare side, because uh, those, th those three dimensions interact, obviously the education has to be good. Candidly at NUS, we're not too bad at that now after significant experience. The technology side, that's also there are technological fixes available and we're all now au fait with Zoom technology and so on. But it's really that social welfare side, how these, these things intersect in a population that is needy. Uh, and so, for example, I've got three kids who've been studying at home uh, during the circuit breaker period, but I'm lucky that we've got at least enough space here that they can be, they can be in a sort of soundproof almost environment. Uh, but if we were living in uh, one large room, uh, backing up onto each other, then that home-based learning becomes much, much more challenging. 
uh, or if you have parents who are essential services uh, and not able to supervise the children, how does that work out? So these two things are what I would throw out. One is that general life experience. So if you've started a company, run a company, uh, that's going to be enormously helpful to our students, really whatever type of company it was. Um, but if you do have particular sectoral expertise uh, that could guide our students, that would also be very, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, most helpful. Well, um, this, the questions, there's all the questions that we have. To, and uh, so in, in, in summary, uh, this afternoon, uh, we do have a chance to find out more about the, uh, the NUS Innovation Challenge. What is what's the purpose uh, and and what is the uh, intent of uh, the initiative? We are, we also know about the time the the three panels uh, the three aspect better people better society and and the environment and also there are uh, well, how do we actually the graduates or members of the end society could participate? So Cynthia just Dr. Cynthia has shared with us those uh, various aspect. And we also know the timeline. So I think um, I will invite, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cynthia, Professor Simon, Professor Robbie, and uh, Professor KK. Now I will invite uh, Pauline to share with us one slide where those of us who participated in this, uh, do, I, do we have one more question? Does this came up? Okay, we have, okay, sorry. There's one more question before we actually bring on the post webinar uh, form. Um, uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, this, this, is, this is not relevant uh, to uh, the innovation challenge, but it's a uh, question, uh, maybe Cynthia, you could help address, just curious to know what's the percentage of the current graduating students who have secured job offers, if you don't mind uh, answering uh, that question. Uh, to be very honest with you, I don't have this data right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know whether Prof. Simon, uh, Prof. KK and Prof. Robbie separately has, uh, I mean. So, I so there is a graduate employment survey, but that only comes out usually around February, I think, uh, each year for the following year. Uh, I can tell you it's harder than it was in the past. Anecdotally, we don't have the full data. Law school actually is a little bit simpler because the students who graduate from law school go on to do their professional training. Most of them already have training certificates. Uh, but I do know across the university, it's, it's more challenging than in the past, but I know we're all hoping that the recovery when it comes will be swift uh, and that this will be a bridging opportunity, um, but not just seen as a band-aid to uh, cover over a period of economic dislocation, but really, as all of us have been emphasizing, planting a seed, a seed of entrepreneurialism, but also of community spirit to ensure that our graduates take the opportunities that they have to really make a difference uh, for the people, the society and the larger world. Yeah, thank you. So that's it for the afternoon. So uh, Pauline, could you uh, bring on uh, to share the QR code so that members can complete the form and indicate uh, the interest and we can follow up uh, with the members. So uh, we will opt the video and share just one slide showing uh, the uh, form that members could uh, indicate the interest and area where uh, you can volunteer in. So thank you very much, Dr. Cynthia and Professor Simon, Professor Robbie and Professor KK. Thank you and have a good evening. May borrow thank you. Well, have a, have a good afternoon first and then have a good evening. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> afternoon and an evening. Yes, yeah, thank you. Bye everyone, bye-bye. Thanks, bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you.